and see that's the difference between what I'm talking about and what adapting our message, accepting people. Even if somebody's gay and they come to me and say, you know what, is it okay if I come into your chat room? Sure. I'm not against you because you're gay. I'm against you because of the sin. I don't agree with the sin, but that doesn't mean I don't love you as a person. That doesn't mean I'm not interested in you as a person. And we have to make that distinction because, you know, what the LGBT community says is, well, Christians are all just, you know, they, they, they don't love us. They hate us. They're against us. And that's not true at all because sin is sin. It doesn't matter what sin it is. God doesn't look at one sin in particular and go, I mean, there, I guess there are degrees of evil in wickedness. You know, there's a difference between um, stealing somebody's parking spot and murdering somebody. <laughs> you know, on that level, that's a, di a difference in morality there. But sin is sin. And we, when we look at sin, sin and, and anything that sin is basically anything that corrupts us or addicts us we get addicted to it in a way that it becomes life controlling it could be anything it could be alcohol it could be cocaine it could be gambling yeah it could be anything so really it's the, it's it's the addiction part of it that becomes so bad but anyway and i wanted to share this with you because this was interesting to me there's a, a missionary uh, way back in the like 1800s and it was a man named Hudson Taylor. And he and this is what happened to him. People, the story is told of Hudson Taylor who dressed in Chinese costume. Now he was an he was an Englishman that went to China to be a missionary, and he dressed like them. He assimilated to their culture. This is what I'm talking about. He wanted to reach them, so he would dress in their in the same way as they did he was waiting for a boatman to take him across a river as he stood on the dock a richly dressed chinese man came also on a weighted transportation when the boat came near the man not seeing that mr taylor was a foreigner struck him on the head and knocked him over into the mud taylor said his first impulse was to smite the man but god immediately stopped him and when the boat drew alongside the man looked more closely at Mr. Taylor, whom he had abused, and suddenly recognized that he was a foreigner. He could hardly believe his eyes and said, What, you a foreigner, and you would not strike me back when I struck you like that? The missionary replied, Friend, this boat is mine. Come in, and I will take you where you want to go. On the way, Mr. Taylor poured into the Chinaman's ear the wondrous message of salvation. When the missionary left, tears of repentance and joy were running down the face of his former attacker. Such is the power of the gospel to transform enemies of God and man into eternal friends. So because Hudson Taylor assimilated his lifestyle to the Chinese, he didn't try to go in there and act like, oh, I'm a foreigner, I'm better than you, or whatever. He humbled himself. And because of that, in this situation, he didn't strike the man back. He could have. Because he didn't do that. I'm reading from a book that is probably from the 1950s. So if something in that China man was not an offensive word back then, if, if it was, then, you know, I don't know why it would be somebody is from china they're from china that doesn't necessarily mean anything bad so if it struck you in a way that's adverse i apologize but i am in no way saying that that word is offensive it's just a word that describes something of where somebody is from i'm an american i'm from america that's not a bad thing to say if somebody's from china that's where he's from so anyway, what I wanted to do is, sh is share that because what we understand here 
is that when you're when you're trying to reach people as we are and this is what what we're doing here we're also trying to put ourselves out there where we can help people that need help people that want help people that are are searching for god i want to be able to you know help you in your search that's the whole reason i'm here and so sometimes when we do things people look at that and they think that we're judging them or that we're being you know unfair when we're not paul wasn't judging the israelites in some adverse way he wanted them to know christ the messiah as he did that was his objective that was his purpose there's another case in which paul did something that made him stand out in his mission and let me see if i can find it here so as he's going into thessalonica he comes into athens now while paul was waiting for them in athens His spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. His spirit was stirred within him. That means he was saddened, but he was also angry at the idols that he saw. You see, the same Paul that was willing to do all things to win all men to Christ. Now, there's that fine line I was talking about. He has a burden in his heart because of the idols that that were in Athens, in Greece. There were those that worshipped idols. There were those that were, there were Stoics. There were there were philosophers. The Greeks. They were very superstitious, and they had all these different philosophies. They had many gods and so forth. But this caused Paul to be stirred. Because there is a time that we need to be stirred when we see idolatry and sin. I wanted to show that side of, of Paul as well. The same Paul that was willing to when somebody to christ was not willing to compromise the gospel to do that we cannot compromise the word of god we can't compromise the gospel for any man because our first and foremost responsibility as christians is to the lord and to his words and if something was a grievous or grievous to god then it should be a grievous to us we cannot have it both ways. We can't have God and sin at the same time. Jesus said you can't serve God in money. You can't serve God in something else. You're either going to serve me or you're going to serve that idol, that thing, whatever it is. But you can't have it both ways. So tonight, there is that separation that we have to do in our life if we're going to follow christ we have to say lord i'm willing to take the cross i'm willing to live for you we need to have jesus in our life if we're going to follow jesus and we have to follow him on his terms and not ours and that's important but i wanted to share this too because in another place in acts 18 verse 18 he says This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallo said to the Jews, if, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O oh Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names in your own law, 
See to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers. And he set sail for Syria and with him Priscilla and Aquila at Centuria. And he had cut his hair for he was under a vow. Paul cut his hair because he was under a vow. Now, we don't know what the vow was, but most likely it was a Nazarite vow under the Old Testament in the book of Numbers. If you were a Nazarite at a certain time, you cut your hair as a vow. Now, why would Paul do this? Being a Christian, he's not under the law. He doesn't have to do the vow. He did it as a, again, to show the Jews that he was trying to win to Christ. That he wanted them to know that he was willing to be as they were. He was because Paul was a Jew. He was born a Jew um, of the Benjamite tribe. Nobody said being Jewish is a sin. We're talking about the Messiah, Christ, which came to show the way. And Paul was saying to his brothers, Paul was a Jew that believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, was, was the Christ, the anointed one. And so there were Jews that didn't believe that, that were still under the Old Testament law. And so there was a difference in the ideas that they had doctrinally and mentally, there were differences. So what I'm saying is Paul was willing to still perform the, in the ceremonies. He celebrated all of the Jewish feast. He didn't, he didn't take all of that and just throw it away. Shows that he was willing to be all things to all men in order to win them to Christ. And many priests were converted. To Christ many Jews were converted to Christ but that does not mean that in any way shape or form Jews are bad or anything like that that's not what I'm saying at all that is that would be uh, you know absolutely wrong but what we're talking about is 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 the accepting of the Messiah whether or not you know a person believes that or not some don't believe that there's a difference in that belief so that's what we're talking about there. But that's not really the fullness of what we're saying. Timothy, who was on one side of his, uh, on the mother's side was Greek, but on his father's side, he was Jewish. So he had both Jewish and Greek parents. Now, he didn't have to get circumcised, but Paul had him circumcised so that he could represent the gospel to the Jews at that time. Now, that's what we're talking about. So, you know, we're not talking about uh, anything else. Um, I personally uh, pray for Israel. I love Israel. I'm a proponent of Israel. Totally 100%. And and I think that we they're our greatest ally that we have in the world and they're a democracy like we are. So we hold a lot of similarities. Well, again, not going to get into a political argument about Palestine. I don't agree with what the Palestinians have done. I think that they're killing their own people on the borders, a sign of that, the Gaza Strip and all of that, but I'm not going to get into that right now. But the point I'm making, and I don't want to get off track here, because we can talk about a lot of different things. And But the end of this message, and I'm going to close, is about reaching people. And sometimes we have to be willing to... Some Christians are, I don't know how to say it other than to say, their way of, of evangelizing or reaching out is to tell people, you're going to hell. 
on Twitter. You see that all the time. You're going to hell. And you know what? Hell's a real place. And I'm not going to, I believe that. The Bible talks about it. Jesus talked about it. The Old Testament talks about Sheol, place of the dead. So we know it's a real place. Art of darkness. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. All of that. But I don't think we should be able to. I don't think we should just damn people to hell as our evangelism methods. I think we should. We should try to preach the gospel in a way that doesn't compromise God, because we're not going to compromise God. To, we're not going to win anybody. People see through that. People respect somebody that stands for what they believe. They don't respect somebody that doesn't. And if I'm trying to win somebody to Christ, I'm not going to win them. If I'm willing to say anything that any wishy-washy thing that they want to hear. But through the grace and love of God. As we minister the word of God, pray for people. We can cross into those people's lives and bring the gospel in a way that reaches them, that doesn't compromise. I've seen this happen over and over again. I've had people that were that would come into my chat room and argue with me about God, argue with me about Christ. They would have nothing but nasty things to say about me or to me. They didn't care about uh, anything I was talking about. And, but they kept coming back. They kept coming back. And then sooner or later, they would just say, you know what? I've seen what you said. I believe it. And I had somebody just the other day tell me that, you know, after being on Cosme and hearing me preach and being in some of my services, that finally they said, I want this. I want what you're talking about. They didn't even understand it, but they wanted it. Because it's not me and it's not what I'm doing. It's what God is doing. It's what the Holy Spirit is doing. Believe me, <laughs> there's nothing I'm doing that could bring anybody to Christ. But it is the Holy Spirit's job. That's what he does. The Bible, you know, somebody said. Somebody said. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the hound of heaven. And he. He will chase us and chase us. And even David said. King David said. Even though I make my bed in hell and shield, thou art there. When Jonah was in the belly of the well, he said he was in the belly of hell. And even there, God was. You can't outrun the long arm of God. You see, that's the great thing about God is he will work with us our whole life. He, you know, I was raised in church. I told you that. I was, I was born from a godly mother who was a prayer warrior. And my whole teenage life was, was a mess. I've told you my testimony. I was, you know, on drugs. I was completely outside of the will of God. In every single way, I was doing things that were, that were wrong, bad, evil, whatever you want to say. But you got somebody praying for you, and all of a sudden, God starts to work. And he sends people into our life. And he continues to water that seed that's planted. And it's like the, the you know, the movie. I've shared it before. It's called, um, it's called The Hound of Heaven. It's a poem that was written by a, friend, a guy named Francis. He was, a, he lived in England. He was a poet. He would write amazing poetry. But he got addicted to what back then, this was like in the 1800s, it was opium. But 
it's kind of like our heroin today. And he would get, he was so addicted to heroin that he ended up um, completely almost, almost dead. Some Franciscan priest took him in. Some Christian, a Christian couple found him his uh, literature. And they were like blown away at how incredible he could write. So they said, we're going to do everything we can. And they took him to this monastery. And while he was there, he had a dream. And in the dream, he could see his whole life. That God was was chasing him. In every step of his life, he could remember a voice that was calling him. But he kept refusing it. He kept refusing. Then he heard another voice, and it was the voice of the opium. And he, he went after that voice. And he went after all kinds of different voices until he came to the end of his life. And he was, he was going to commit suicide. And then they took him in, and, and, and in, the, in his dream, he could see at the very end of his time there that God was still calling him. And, and he wrote this beautiful poem about the hound of heaven. And he said, God said to him, was not my voice the only one? that truly loved you and he said yes yours was the only one and he got saved he accepted christ and it changed his whole entire life and they wrote a, a movie about it and uh, a country singer a female country singer wrote a song called the hound of heaven it's a beautiful one of the greatest songs i've ever heard based on that poem. Now the poem was written in Old English and then it's been remodified and you can you can go and get it online. It's called The Hound of Heaven. But maybe sometime I'll show the movie. The movie's uh, animated, it's, it's like a cartoon, but it has like, it's about 30 minutes long, but it's really good and at the end they have that song. But the point is, this is real. The voice of God. Now, people have heard the voice of God, but they've not understood it, just like he didn't understand it. Why would somebody love me so much that my whole life they're watching over me and waiting for me to come? And that's exactly the reason I related to that story, because it was like my life. So many times God sent people to tell me and I didn't listen until finally I did. And so I can understand that. But there is nothing like the love of God. People don't understand this. And I can understand some people's view, you know, when they read some of the Old Testament and you see things in you, you question, is God a loving God? Like, I mean, he did a lot of things that were war related and things like that. But then you see in the middle of an Old Testament prophecy, <laughs> God is weeping over Syria. He's weeping over, over uh, um, the Edomites in different groups of people that he had to judge. People don't see that. They don't get that. They don't understand the heart of God and that he loves us in spite of ourselves, in spite of our sin, in spite of the things that we do. And so that's part of the message tonight is that we have to love people in spite of what irritates us about them. <laughs> Does that make sense? How many of you got somebody in your life that's irritating you right now? A brother, a sister, a parent, your sister. <laughs> we, can, we can all say, yeah, there's people. God has literally put people in my life. And, and he has said to me, this person is going to challenge 
everything about you. But when when you're through with this, you're going to be better for it. And, and every time that he's put those people in my life, and I've had them over and over again, he's absolutely right. There's people that he puts in my life, and he puts them there for a reason. And not only are they helping me, but I'm hopefully trying to help them. And so getting back to that, that's what we have to do. So sometimes it's messy when you're trying to reach people. Sometimes it's not, you know, like, hey, this is easy, right? No, it's not. Sometimes God calls us to care for somebody that keeps letting us down over and over again. I've, I've had that happen. I had a lady that came into my ministry probably about seven years ago. And she pretended to be somebody else, did the old catfish thing like she was somebody else. She pretended that she had cancer. Then she pretended she died. And we were all concerned for her, prayed for her, and did all this. And then, you know, I, I sensed things were not true in my spirit. God gave me discernment. I realized that she was lying to us. She wanted attention in the most unbelievably horrible way. A lot of people would have just said, well, that's it. I'm done with that person. And pretty much that's what I did for about a year. And then she showed up on Facebook where she confessed everything to me, what she had done. Well, fast forward. She's been a part of my ministry for seven years. Her life hasn't been any pretty, but it's better. She's She was on heroin. She got off heroin. She was homeless. She had all these problems. I didn't give up on her. All I wanted was honesty, and she gave it to me. And then from that point on, me and her have been on this on a level path. She's, you know, had surgeries. She's been a person that's been in my ministry for all that time. And the point is. You're, if you're going to reach out to people, and some of you may do that, some of you may feel led to really share Christ in a way that maybe you've never shared Christ before. Maybe you seeing that as an opportunity. I'm just going to tell you right now, it's not always going to be easy. <laughs> Sometimes you're going to have people that God puts in your life, in your path, that are going to keep disappointing you or disappointing the Lord or disappointing everything. And you have to say, okay, what, what am I supposed to do? And you may have people in your life right now that you prayed for or, or that you've tried to help. And maybe they're, you know, like people in my life that I've seen people get off heroin. I've seen people get off drugs. I've seen them now, now they're, they're, they're off the heroin, but they're back on alcohol, you know, or whatever. And they're now they're drinking to the point of passing out. And that's discouraging. But do we give up? No, you keep praying for people. You keep believing God that one day by his power and grace, they're going to make it. Amen. All right. That's good for now. Let's uh, close in prayer. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you tonight for this time we could come together and share the word of God. I pray for every person here tonight that they will have an encounter with you, Lord, in a mighty way. I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided 
to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me. prayer tonight to follow Jesus maybe you never thought about it maybe it's never been something that it's really meant anything or whatever the case is tonight we can all follow him he's given us that grace every person here has the ability because it's not of ourself God doesn't call us to do this on our own. He says, follow me, but I'll give you the grace. I'll give you the power to live for me. That's the difference. He didn't just say, do this, do that, and give us commandments. But he said, I, not only will I give you the commandment, but I'll give you the power to live the commandment. Jesus said, a new commandment I give you. That you love one another. Even as I have loved you. Now see that's the difference. Even as I. Even as God loves us. We have to love others. Now that's impossible. For us to do. And God knew that would be impossible. So he gave us. The grace. Of his son. And the power of the Holy Spirit. To be able to live that out. And walk that out in our life. And it's not going to come easy. I still have <laughs> days where, I mean, just like anybody else. So I'm going to pray right now. And if maybe this is the first time you're praying this prayer. Maybe it's the first time that you're reaching out like this. But I'm just going to pray. And if there's something that you're agreeing with in this prayer, then I want you to pray it. And just say, Lord God, I thank you. For sending your son, Jesus, the Messiah, the Lord, Yeshua, to die on the cross for my sins. And I pray that you, Lord God, would come into my heart through your son, Jesus Christ. And that you would give me life. That you would give me meaning and purpose. That you would restore that relationship that was broken by Adam's sin. That has been restored by the cross of Calvary through the blood of Jesus Christ that shedding of blood was the forgiveness of our sins and right now Lord I receive that forgiveness that I could live for you that I could be a whole new person the Bible says that anyone that believes on him shall have everlasting life and that life starts now the minute you accept him that life starts the Holy Spirit comes in and begins to dwell in you and live in you and and that's that's the joy the peace amen so if you've done that tonight if you've asked then believe god that he's going to help you and that he's not going to abandon you to do this on your own if you want his help tonight just call on him he'll fill that emptiness he'll fill that darkness he'll fill that place with his light and his glory, and his peace, and you'll never be the same. Because I wasn't the same, and Caleb wasn't the same, Diligent wasn't the same, and anyone else, Lashia, and anyone else tonight that has received him, you know you're not the same person you were. God did something in your life. Hallelujah. Just like he did in my life. Amen. So, praise God. Well, it's it's been a it's.
it's been a great time. Amen, Spencer. God bless you. Amen. Thank you guys for being on here and, and for uh, listening and sharing with us. These, these are good times to be on here, to be able to have the Lord with us. And you know what? We're not going to be perfect, but we're going to do the best we can to serve the Lord and to give him our hearts. And when we do that, God takes care of the rest. All right. So, you know, if, if you have prayer requests, you know, we have a prayer uh, channel. Just keep letting us know what they are. We do pray about that stuff that's important to us. And we'll get to those things as we, as we go along. And uh, so keep us posted on that stuff. Let's pray for that person that was on the ventilator tonight before we go. Father, we pray for this aunt that's on the ventilator that needs a healing touch tonight. We pray for your miraculous healing in her body that she'll be able to breathe on her own without a ventilator. Even tonight, Lord, we pray for that miracle in her body in the name of Jesus. We pray for others that are sick with COVID tonight. God, bring healing wherever they are tonight by your grace and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Um, uh, as of right now, our next gathering is Thursday night, 9 o'clock. So... And then after next Sunday night, we'll be here on a more regular basis doing chat and different things. I'm not always going to be preaching and stuff like that, but we're going to do a lot of different activities. All right. God bless everybody. We'll see everybody later. Hopefully uh, have a good uh, Labor Day. Good night and God bless. And somebody wanted to chat with me, so let's do that right now while we're...